my job, Aaron, really as a photographer, and doesn't matter if I'm a sports photographer or if I was, you know, a fashion photographer, news photographer, if I photographed, you know, cars or whatever it was, my job as a photographer is to elicit a response from you, an emotional response from the viewer. If I'm not doing that, then my photographs aren't worth squat. You know, <laughs> they're not they're not doing the, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. This episode is brought to you by West Coast Beach, a year-round beach volleyball club on the west side of Los Angeles in Santa Monica, California. At West Coast Beach, we aim to get 1% better every day, both on and off the court. You can find more info about us at westcoastvbc.com and on Instagram with handle at westcoastvbc. All right, I'm here with the legendary Andrew Bernstein. Andy, thank you so much for being here. Aaron, my pleasure, man. Really nice to meet you. I'm a big fan of what you're doing, and uh, I'm glad we, we can talk today. That's awesome. Likewise, man. Likewise. Andy, you are a legendary Hall of Fame NBA photographer. You're originally from Brooklyn. You're the team photographer for the Lakers, Clippers, Kings, and Sparks. You've documented all of Kobe Bryant's career. You're the director of photography for the Staples Center and the Microsoft Theater LA Live. You're a New York Times bestseller with the Mamba Mentality, How I Play. You're also the host of Legends of Sports podcast, and you just spent four weeks in the NBA bubble. And uh, I'm so glad that you're here. Andy, once again, thanks so much for being here. No, oh, thanks, man. I, and I appreciate all that all those accolades in the intro, except I got to correct you. I spent seven weeks in the bubble. Oh, <laughs> and I know that because it was 53 days that I scratched off the wall, you know, like, <laughs> but uh, oh my yeah, gosh. seven weeks, man, it was something. <laughs> wow. Well, I must've heard that three weeks ago then that you were there for four <laughs> weeks. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Hey, let's, let's jump right in, man. Yeah. Um, Andy, what does living an inspired life mean to you? Oh man. That's a loaded question. Um, you know, I, I have to think about my good friend, Kobe Bryant, our, our late friend, um, and what an ins inspiration he was to watch his life progress from a, a teenager. I met him as a teenager. He just turned 18 years old. And, um, you know, to watch the elements of the Mamba mentality um, mature, really. I mean, he had it in him, but he didn't become the Black Mamba until you know, the second half of his seat of his 20 year tenure. And so, you know, all the elements, um, uh, obsession, curiosity, relentlessness, and uh, strength, all the pillars of the Mamba mentality, that to me is part of living an inspired life. And um, I've been able to take some of those elements at different times into my life uh, during tough times in my personal life, tough times in my business life, uh, professional life. Um, essentially, I would say in a nutshell, um, for me, living an inspired life would be f feeling fulfilled um, professionally, creatively, also um, giving back in some way, um, whether it be um, through my recovery journey, um, through my work, through my uh, relationships um, with people I work with and that I cross paths with every single day. Um, obviously through my family, watching my kids grow up and knowing that uh, my wife and I did a good job. <laughs> you know? And also um, feeling like, like I made a mark in some way, shape or form, you know, um, that my, my work, uh, sort of carries on the legacy of some incredible athletes of some, some great eras. Um, that's very inspiring to me. It's very humbling. Um, I'm in, incredibly grateful to have been in that position to have created some iconic uh, photographs that will live forever. Mm. I, I mean, I'm inspired by you because not, not only am I an athlete, I'm a fan i'm a huge nba fan obviously i'm a lakers fan uh mm -hmm. grew up watching kobe um uh grew up watching everybody like magic kobe mm -hmm. uh you name them but um I i'm inspired by you because you've been able to capture moments you know mm -hmm. and not just moments but before we were talking about that emotion right capturing emotion and and being able to allow other people to relate to that emotion even if they're not a, a superstar athlete 
you know, and, and that's really inspiring to me. And, and I, I guess I, I want to know, how do you stay inspired outside of the game, not just the game of basketball, but the game of photography? Ooh, um, well, as a, as a dad, um, I'm continually inspired because um, it, it's the greatest job any man could ever have is to be a father. Mm. It's also very demanding and it's very challenging. And you are um, responsible, you know, <laughs> for, for this human being from birth until, you know, when they leave your house. And by the way, they never really leave your house. You know, they might physically leave, but they don't leave. And it's a wonderful thing. And I have kids, I have three kids in LA. I have one in Philadelphia and uh, I watch them from afar. I watch them up close. Uh, my oldest is going to be 26. My youngest is 12. <laughs> and so that's, that's incredibly inspiring to me to, to know that, my job is to lead a life of integrity and um, to set an example and to be able to uh, lead by example um, because I got that from my parents and primarily from my dad. My mom was wonderful and nurturing and terrific, but my dad's work ethic and what he instilled in me in just to love sports, for example, but also to love what I do um, was very important. And so I'm trying to do that as a dad. And uh, when I see, you know, my kids accomplish something or I just see their smiley face in the morning, you know, that's inspiring to me. It's a wonderful thing. Absolutely. That's that's great. Um, let's talk a little bit about the bubble since you mm -hmm. just spent seven weeks there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not four. Um, I and, wish and it was four, but uh, that's you're right. All <laughs> <told> the <this> story. <laughs> what, what a what a weird, crazy year, right? Um, mm -hmm. For specifically for the NBA and and the the playoffs and the finals. So, could you just talk a little bit about that experience and and anything that came up that was inspiring to you? Mm. Well, here's the deal. <laughs> March 11th, uh, I go to Staples Center to do a game. Um. All of my clients were in full blast. You know, I, I'm like you said, I'm the director of photography for AEG. So Staples Center had all their events going on. Microsoft Theater had a full slate of events. I had three teams playing at the same time with the Lakers, the uh, the Clippers, and the Kings. We also had two G League teams going, wow. um, and myself and my crew were just busy. I mean, sometimes we had we could have three or four events in a day that we had to cover. You know, in different different venues. So I go to the game, come back from the game, everything shuts down, you know, uh, Rudy Gobert tests positive. The game in uh, Oklahoma City is canceled. Next thing we know in the morning, the entire NBA shuts down for good. And of course, you know, everything else followed suit after that. So I didn't work. <laughs> I didn't physically work until I went to the bubble. I'm, this is March 11th. I went to the bubble on August 20th. So that's, you know, it's five and a half months of not working, not earning. Um, thank God for the uh, PPP program, which, you know, kept the door open and kept a couple of my employees and myself uh, uh, paid for a little bit. But it was getting to be crunch time, Aaron. You know, <laughs> it's like I had to start working. Thank God my right. wife was working, too. But she's working from home. She's an attorney. Um, so I was very grateful um, that the NBA figured out a way to to, to make it happen. Um, and they did. They the bubble was um, incredibly well thought out. It was well executed. Um, I felt 100% safe once I got there. You know, and keep in mind, we're in central Florida where COVID everywhere around us is absolutely exploding, right? Still is, but even especially when we were there. And um, I was offered, uh, essentially, they broke the, my Boston NBA photos broke up the bubble into like three segments. Um, you know, sort of the, the prep in the beginning and then the middle sort of when playoffs started and the end, which would be essentially conference finals and finals. And, um, you know, we talked about it. I, I preferred to go to the end and I think he, he preferred me to be there at the end. So I got to watch the beginning of the bubble on TV, which was interesting. And then once I got down there and of course I was talking to my colleagues that were down there and stuff. So I was kind of prepared. My biggest trepidation, honestly, Aaron was getting on a plane. I hadn't been on a plane since the pandemic started. Right. And uh, my wife wanted me to get a hazmat suit. Uh, mm. Literally or ordered me a hazmat suit on, on wow. Amazon, which I 
thank God I was able to intercept, but, <laughs> but I was full PPP out, you know, and, or PPP would out or whatever you want to call it. And, um, anyway, I got down there. I, I was in, if you're talking about being inspired, I was inspired by the effort that everyone put forth, um, the, the, the players, uh, and coaches first and foremost, because honestly, I didn't see any, um, downturn at all in the, the, the quality of play, um, how serious they were, uh, you know, and, and, you know, keep in mind, these guys are away from their families. They're away from their wives and girlfriends. And I used to that. And, right. um, but they, they had a job to do and they didn't, uh, you know, they didn't hold back. It was beautiful to see. And it was different for me. I wasn't on the court like I normally am. I had to adjust to that. I had to adapt to a new, you know, new shooting situation. I, I couldn't do my behind the scenes coverage, which is near and dear to my heart, which is what I love. They kept us, you know, socially distant from the players at all times, even in the championship locker room, you know, shooting the Lakers, you know, flying, throwing champagne all over the place. We had to be a little bit back from them, not right on top. Like we used to be. So, um, the biggest inspiration was coming home <laughs> was uh, <laughs> basically, you know, I don't want to say surviving it because I don't want it to sound like it was, you know, a survival um, exercise, but it was psychologically challenging. It was difficult to know that, that I was in a, in, in a situation where I, I couldn't leave, you know, it was confining. Um, they tried to make it as, as good as they could and comfortable as they mm -hmm. could. But, you know, you know, you can't leave. I mean, you, you walk off that small campus that we had and you know, that's it. You can't come back. So they kept it safe. Um, I produced some, some good work. I thought I recorded it. Uh, it was definitely a historical achievement and I was glad to be part of it. Yeah. Very cool. Well, let's talk a little bit specifically about the Lakers, mm -hmm. um, not only because um, they won, but because I'm a huge fan. And uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to know from your eye, since you have such a great eye, um, what specifics can you talk about from LeBron? You know, you 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 watched him work. You watched him. um you could you could throw in any other teammate as well, like an AD or, or anyone you want. But I specifically want to know about LeBron and, and what you saw from him. You know, was it was it the work ethic? Was it the focus? The, was there moments of Kobe mentality that came through from him? Talk a little bit about LeBron. Yeah, I mean, first of all, you're talking about being inspired by a guy who's been in the league 17 years and is uh, playing at that level that he right. is, that continues to play at. He has tremendous uh, personal pride. He has a second. Well, I guess he is second to Kobe because Kobe had the most amazing work ethic that I've ever seen, but his, his workout regimen, um, you know, his work ethic, the way he approaches the game, um, the way he, the seriousness of, of the way he takes his job. I mean, it's his job. Right. Um, and the way he, uh, motivates and inspires his teammates, um, all, all of the above, um, adds up, added up to really, um, to a wonderful combination, but it was challenging to document that in a still photograph. <laughs> you know, if you're doing video or you're shooting behind the scenes or you're following the guy around, you know, that's one thing, but in, in a single photograph or a group of, of single still photographs, it's a challenge. And I, I, I'm up to that challenge because I've been doing that my whole career. Um, but to see it culminate in the championship was, uh, I'm sure for him, incredibly rewarding. Um, it was wonderful to see for me, who I've been attached to the the organization for almost 40 years, and uh, you know, I, I don't know how, how many championships I've seen. Um, five with the Lakers, with five with Kobe and Shaq, and now this one. So it's 11. <laughs> it's 11 championships. It's pretty amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the um, I don't know the way that that he and, and Anthony Davis gelled uh, and how LeBron kind of kept pushing AD and kept, you know, wouldn't settle for anything less than greatness from him. Very Kobe-esque. Um, right. Kobe was great at at pushing his teammates as far as they could go and then even further. And, right. uh, you know, Kobe was he knew that some of his teammates, you know, 
didn't have the talent that he had, uh, but they could have the desire that he had. They could have the will. Um, they could, you know, have the work ethic by watching him <laughs> primarily. And I think that rubs off so that, you know, I saw that with LeBron. I saw that with Kobe. I saw that with magic going back to, to the Showtime days. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I think that's a really good segue to talk about Kobe a little mm -hmm. bit more in detail, um, pun intended detail. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you, you mentioned that you, you take incredible still photos and one of uh one of the interviews that i heard with with um with you was was talking about oh it was actually it was the one with kobe where he actually said that he studied some of the photos that you took to help him with his game mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. i mean to me that's awesome I, and and i think you were even a little taken back by that you're like wait you were studying the photos not video and yeah. he was saying that like yeah i actually get a lot more information sometimes from the photos mm -hmm. um talk a little bit about kobe and let's get into that and get into your, your relationship with him i know that he's kind of allowed you in his inner circle for all the, the his 20-year career talk about kobe well it's, it's interesting aaron because when kobe um came into the league in 96 i had already been working in the league for 13 years at that point and uh I had, I had kind of made my mark with um, the Laker organization, the NBA, but primarily with the Lakers at that point, the Clippers as well. Um, and there was a, a lot of trust that had, that had been accumulated <laughs> over, over that. You know, I had banked a lot of trust and the trust comes from integrity, professional integrity, personal integrity, um, also being discreet and knowing when to get in, when to get out. Um, and never making it really about you, about me, the photographer. It's about them. So when I met Kobe, he was familiar with me. He's familiar with my work. Um, that kind of blew me away at 18 years old that he knew who I was because he had all my posters hanging in his room, you know, and it's really crazy. Yeah, that's what he said. That's cool. And uh, we hit it off right away because honestly, you know, I was 20 years older than him. And, and but I saw something in him at 18 that I saw in myself when I was 18. Um, an edge, you know, a confidence, um, a, a sort of um, a, a willingness to, to really do anything to um, build a career and to make a mark. And, you know, he had so much talent. Um, I wish I had a, a, you know, an eighth of the talent as a photographer as he had as a basketball player at 18 years mm -hmm. old. But, um, you know, never taking no for an answer, uh, whatever naysayers he might've had in his career, you know, coming out of high school, people doubting him, he used that as fuel. You know, I had the same situation when I was in school where I was, I was really um, discouraged from being a sports photographer at the school that I went to. It was a commercial art school and uh, discouraged. I was discouraged. Yeah. Because I, I transferred, it was art center college of design and I transferred there to um, really learn how to be a professional photographer, how to um, learn the science of photography, uh, everything, you know, on the creative side as well, and how to run a business and all that stuff. But they were very commercial and advertising oriented and, and photojournalism, especially sports photography was not something that they promoted there. Mm. Um, I don't know why they accepted me, honestly, uh, <laughs> but they did. But I, I use that as, as motivation, you know, just like he did. You know, um, Coach Del Harris didn't play him very much as a rookie. Uh, so, you know, he took that as, okay, you're not going to play me as a rookie. I'm going to, you know, in the summer between my rookie and second year, I'm going to get better so that you almost have to play me, you know. And if you remember um, that playoff series against Utah when he chucked three air balls in yeah. a row during the yeah. playoffs – um, you know, any, any other guy that might've broken their spirit, you know, but he, you know, Kobe walked away from that. Like, okay, I got to get better. That's it. He yeah. That for motivation. So our relationship just grew. The, the trust was there from the beginning. I, I never wanted to do anything to, um, threaten that trust in any way. He took me really under his wing into his inner, inner sanctum, which was, you know, his family, uh, before he got married, then of course when he met Vanessa, and then with the kids, and and uh, traveling, and doing a lot of off the court things, you know, um, 
promotions and endorsements and charity events and stuff that, you know, he just allowed me in. It was wonderful. Yeah. Um, never once in the 20 years that we spent together, did he ever say to me, Hey man, you know, that's enough. Or you took, you took enough pictures or get the hell out. You know, he never said that. Um, I think he knew that I knew that I, that I always had a sixth sense for that. And I, that kind of came from being around Pat Riley first and foremost, and then around Phil Jackson, because, you know, those two guys, you know, kind of kept me on my toes. And, uh, you know, I learned, I learned when was right and when wasn't right to be, you know, in the room. Um, and, you know, I, I had accumulated this mountain of photography that had never been published. I mean, a lot of my photography, of course, over his 20 year career had been published, but, you know, right, right uh, around, around when he was going to retire, I went to him, I said, look, man, I, I got so much photography that I've done that no one's ever seen. We, we, ne we need to figure out a way to get this out, you know? And I went and met with him and met with his marketing team. I've made this whole presentation about this sort of coffee table book and stuff. And he didn't want any part of that. He said, we're going to do a book together, but it's not going to be this book. I want to do a book that really lets people into what makes me tick you know, as, as the black Mamba, but as a basketball player, as a human being, as, as a teacher, um, as somebody who's going to inspire others, you know, so you could be a coach, you could be a basketball player in high school, you could be a dad or a mom. Um, anybody is going to learn something from this book and, and it's going to be illustrated. It's going to be told through my words, he said, and illustrated through my photos, you know? So that was like, an incredible gesture <laughs> and we sat down and we um, sketched it out. We brought in a, a great publisher and design team and the mama mentality book was, was a true Testament to his, to his legacy. I mean, now it lives on as the thread uh, and the connection between millions and millions of fans who adore him. Yeah. Well, congratulations for that. I know it was a, a New York times bestseller and it's right mm -hmm. behind you. You could point to it. Oh yeah. One. How do I do that backwards? The uh, other way. Oh, yeah. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> <It's the cover. laughs> there it is. Um, yeah, no, that that's great. You know, and, and to have him immortalized like that in a book with your mm -hmm. photos is so cool. And, um, I can't wait to get mine. It's coming. <laughs> um, but you know, let, let's stay on Kobe for a little bit more because uh, mm -hmm. like I told you before, I, I was a huge fan of his. I still am. Um, I still learn from him, even though he's, um, you know, he's passed RIP mm -hmm. Kobe and, uh, and Gigi, but um, he, he mentioned something in your, uh, your podcast episode with him, which I will link uh, to this one. Thank you. Cause yeah. it was a great episode. Yeah. Um, he said something about the revolving door of priorities. <laughs> yeah. There you go. That's yeah. Well, I wrote that down. I was wondering if you could touch on that. Cause I think I know what he means, but he, he, I think he was talking about sport and profession, like yes. any, any, right. Well, yeah. yeah, that, that's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up, Aaron, because when he and I were talking, you know, he, he had, he had young kids and he, he was so happy to be a dad, um, a husband, um, have that part of his life. You know, he had been re he was retired when we did the podcast <clears throat> and he had um, seamlessly, I mean, to everybody's surprise, just seamlessly pivoted from this, you know, tunnel visioned, uh, intense Mamba personality, you know, basketball player to being a dad and a businessman and a creator. Um, but we talked about and, you know, I, I was a dad way before he became a dad, but we talked about how once I became a dad that, you know, when I'm with my kids and when they were young and, and trying to kind of juggle everything, yes, life has a revolving door of priorities. You know, sometimes my job takes priority. It has to. And in the, in, in, in the business that we're in professional sports, a, your spouse has to get that right. Or you're doomed in your relationship and mm. B your kids have to get it also. And they have to understand that it's a very demanding life. You know, I, I can't tell you how many dinners I missed at home. Uh, I missed birthdays. You know, I was a divorced dad. I was a single dad for seven years, raising my kids, you know, with uh, custody time and all this stuff going on around that. Um, 
And then when I met my wife that now, uh, you know, she embraced my kids and she had a daughter and we had one together and uh, we raised these three teenagers and, and an infant together, you know, with this crazy job that I have. And if, if I didn't have a spouse that really understood that and accepted it, um, it would have been, it would have been a disaster, quite frankly. So we talk about the revolving door of priorities that sometimes the family takes priority and the family should take priority most of the time, but sometimes it just can't. And I think in everybody's life, it's like that. If you're a doctor, you know, in any profession, my wife's a lawyer. Sometimes my wife has to pull all nighters because she's on a case cases, you know, has a deadline. Um, and I have to understand that. And, you know, I could come home from a game and, you know, she's doing her thing or she's still in the office, you know, and I'm in charge you know, all night or into the morning or whatever. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a real team effort, but um, if you ever, you know, if, if you put something first all the time, whatever's not first is going to suffer. <laughs> mm -hmm. So right. you got to figure out in life how to, at least I did how to, how to have a revolving door of priorities. And can you expand on that for a second? Cause I think that's so important. Um, you know, f for me in this project, this podcast mm -hmm. and my forthcoming book, it's all about tools, right? Mm -hmm. Tools on, on how to find that inspired living mm -hmm. concept or, or, or that curiosity that we were talking about that Kobe yeah. had, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but specifically with the revolving door of priorities, because I think that's so key right now in a world of social media, in a world of attention grabbing, you could put your attention anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, what are some ways that you prioritize? Mm. Well, um, I mean, it's kind of a loaded question and a and much bigger answer, but um, my life wasn't going in the direction I wanted it to go. And uh, I had to really sit down with myself and figure out why things weren't going the way they should and what I had to do. And it was kind of a circle the wagons moment. <laughs> um, and I realized I needed to start on a recovery journey. I had some issues I had to deal with that I had been uh, pushing under the rug that were affecting everything, affecting my professional life, my personal life. And so the tools that you speak of and my sort of mantra for living um, come from the tools of recovery, quite, quite honestly, it's been almost 20 okay. years now. And, you know, it's not, it's not always, uh, you know, not always perfect and it's not a straight line uh, life, but if you have some tools, um, and you can go into that toolbox and you have resources and you have friends and you have people that you can, that can pick you up when you're down. Um, and you have a spouse and you have kids that are really there for you and get you, you know, warts and all, um, you know, that I'm very uh, humbled and grateful for that. And I never want to screw that up. <laughs> right. So um, I found that as, as that journey continued and, I got deeper and deeper into it that things got clearer and that my, my path, my life's path got clearer, um, that things got a little bit easier, that there was, I wasn't all jammed up all the time. And, uh, and, you know, quite frankly, I mean, I just spent seven weeks in this really difficult situation, which I, I couldn't have done if, um, I wasn't, I didn't have the tools to do that. Um, it was very demanding and, uh, I'm just thankful that I, I do have those tools and I, I do have uh, a path that I can continue on. It's also a spirit, a spiritual path. Um, I've learned how to sort of center myself when I'm getting all just out of whack, you know, and that could be honestly, anytime in the car before a game starts during a game, you know, things start going wrong technically or what have you. Um, I, I've learned how to just kind of go within and, just chill, take a breath. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Uh, that's been very helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, this pandemic has been so hard on all of us um, that the, the psychological toll it's taken on so many of us. I mean, thank God, you know, I'm mm -hmm. knocking on wood everywhere that my family and I've stayed healthy. Um, but, you know, mix that in with the political climate going on, with everything going on, uh, with social justice and, man, it's just how much more can life pile on, really? Right. Yeah. I mean, I felt like after the election, quite frankly, that 
that we could all like exhale a little bit, right? Um, no matter which side of the election you were on, quite frankly, I don't know, maybe not if you're on the other side, but <laughs> um, the side I was on is like, okay, you know, now we can sort of, and that took what, like five days to get that resolved. But, um, you know, I think we're going to get a handle on COVID. I think sports are going to come back at some point in some way close to the way we, they, they used to be. And we're used to having might take a year, two years, who knows? Right. Um, the economy is going to come back. You know, um, we're not going to bring back the almost 300,000 people who are dead, which, uh, you know, is a whole other story. Um, right. That is just a, unbelievable travesty of our government but um you know i i don't know where i'm going with this but <laughs> fact being is that um, i'm feeling very optimistic for the future good and i wasn't feeling very optimistic honestly back in oh maybe april may june it's when it started to drag and then once the nba announced hey you know what we're gonna do this we're gonna play uh i got i got kind of a second wind you know, yeah, when, good. when I went down there, I felt like I was really accomplishing something. Well, that's great. I, I It's a good segue to emotions. You know, a big part of this project and really life in general is emotional management. Mm -hmm. um, something I really admire about your profession, like I said earlier, is you capture these moments of emotion, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it be a championship, um, the the there's a couple iconic photos that I'd like to touch on, um, like the one that comes to mind is the KD and Steph Curry embracing. Oh, I got uh, that right behind me. Oh, really? It's right there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right there. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. We with the right. wide, uh, the yes. wide lens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. So like those moments are so emotional, but I wanted to talk about, and you could tie it into, um, to the bubble and your recent experience, but mm -hmm. the emotional management of the story of capturing emotions you can you, you can feel it even with the coaching staff i'm sure that mm -hmm. you've, you've just seen so much emotional shifting up and down mm -hmm. i would love for you to talk about that as well as from your end on a personal end being a photographer how do you manage your own emotions during all that stuff yeah i mean my job aaron really as a photographer and doesn't matter if i'm a sports photographer or if i was you know a fashion photographer news photographer I photographed, you know, cars or whatever it was. My job as a photographer is to elicit a response from you, an emotional response from the viewer. If I'm not doing that, then my photographs aren't worth squat. You know, <laughs> they're not, they're not doing the, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Now mix in the fact that, it, you know, I get to shoot these amazing events and these incredible athletes, you know, NBA, NHL, MLB, uh, football, whatever it could be. Um, you know, sports has an inherent emotion to it. Um, but to be able to record it and to have you, the viewer, whoever's viewing my photos, feel something, you know, you're going to feel elated. You're going to feel sad. If it's, you know, if it's a sad moment. You're going to feel like, wow, I saw that on TV and what, you know, this is the photo from that, or I was at that game, or my dad took me to that game or showed me that picture when I was a kid, you know, all that stuff. So mm -hmm. that's really important. Um, the part B to your question is, is, com is completely is like vital because I, I can't be a fan in the moment, right? Mm. I have to detach myself 100% from what's going on and just be completely in the space of recording what's in front of me because that's my job. If I'm, if I take my eye out of the camera and I'm watching, then I might as well be home on my couch right. <laughs> watching it right. on TV because my job is to record it for, and that's why they put me in that position, why I've earned that position over these number of years. And, you know, yes. Do I go back to my hotel room after an NBA finals game and watch it? over and over and over again on sports center. Yeah, of course I do. I read about it in the paper. I'm looking at my other colleagues' photos. I'm looking, you know, I'm talking to journalists. I'm, I'm a fan as much as you and everybody else, but I'm not a fan in the moment. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. You're kind of a player, actually. You're a player within your own game of photographer, mm -hmm. photography. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. I mean, I learned that from so many athletes. I mean, mostly from magic who, who, always seemed just to be floating above everything going on. You know, he just, he just glided through the most uh, intense 
um, heart pounding moments. I remember from Showtime, you know, being in Boston Garden, for example, you have no idea how intense that was. I remember being in Boston Garden, 84, 85 during the finals, and it got so loud, thunderously mm -hmm. loud in there that the parquet floor, literally the parquet floor was moving, was like shifting. The panels in the floor were shifting. Uh, and it was, you know, 95 degrees in there. And there's magic, cool as a cucumber, man, just leading the team down to a championship in 85. It was beautiful. Um, same thing with Kobe. You know, Shaq was a lot more emotional, but um, but knew when to turn it on, when to turn it off. Um, Kobe was the same way. He's incredibly, um, um, I guess, emotional is the word, but emotional within the game. You know, he didn't mm -hmm. let the he didn't let the game dictate uh, how he was going to approach the game, uh, if that makes any sense. He yeah. he took the game and 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 turned the game the way he needed it to go, <laughs> and yeah. uh, he was a master at that. Um, the Mamba was uh, second to none. I mean, Jordan did the same thing. I remember. I remember Michael. It just astounds me how these guys, you know, their heart rates are like this, you know, in the most tense and, and intense moments. But yeah. Uh, my heart's like beating out of my shirt, you know, but <laughs> it's just incredible. You know, in that uh, podcast episode with Kobe, you you guys talked about how uh, you caught him meditating and and you thought that maybe the shutter yeah. might distract him. Um, yeah. And he, he was like, no, yeah. <laughs> it's like nothing can distract me. Like and right. and do you use meditation? Meditation keeps yeah. coming up mm -hmm. when when I talk to champions or or yeah. people who are just craftsmen. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how that helps you? Yeah, I, I got introduced to Kriya Yoga meditation um, through the uh, Self-Realization Fellowship. It's a spiritual path. Yeah, um, SRF. Yeah, yes. SRF, you know, Lake yeah. Shrine, if you're on the West yeah. Side. And right. uh, there's, there's a temple out my way. It used to be in Pasadena. Now it's in Glendale. It's it's not a religion. It's a path. It's a, it's a way of living. It's a spiritual right. way. It's based on meditation and, and right. yoga. And uh I introduce my kids to it. I try to practice it as much as I can. You know, I, I should do it a lot more. Um, but we would go to the service every Sunday if I could, if I didn't have a, a day game and uh, for an hour, listen to a wonderful lecture. My, my kids, when they were little, used to go to the Sunday school class and stuff. Um, I also studied Jewish meditation uh, in my 30s, I think I was. I took some classes in that. Cool. <clears throat> and I recently, um, on my podcast, when the pandemic hit, I reached out to a woman named Lynn Goldberg, who has a an app called Breathe, B R E E T H E. Right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I started I started using the app, and I found like, wow, this is really helping me. Especially, I have insomnia, so I would I would hit up the app, you know, two o'clock in the morning. And man, I'd be out like that, you know? So I reached out to Lynn and she, she was starting to do some amazing work, especially with frontline workers, um, where she was offering the app for free to first responders and nurses and people who just really honestly needed it and maybe needed just five minutes. And uh, so I was able to help her sort of promote that. But she came on the podcast and talked about working with, with you know, A-plus personality athletes and how she taught them how to relax, how to meditate, how to be in the moment, how to center themselves. And, you know, going back to what you said, I, I specifically remember, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've seen, I used to see Kobe meditate during the national anthem, standing there, you know, on the court with the guys um, in the most incredibly intense moments, NBA finals moment. Um, and, and he is, he is somewhere else. I mean, he's certainly, wow. he's certainly physically there, but his mind is able to just sort of center. And I know Phil Jackson, you know, a huge proponent of meditation. Um, right. so I, I learned a lot from the guys that, you know, you know, the athletes I've, I've been around, um, very inspiring, very, uh, necessary because otherwise it'd be like a nervous wreck all the time, you know? And right. <laughs> It's no way to live and that's no way to work. <laughs> right, right. Well, um, I wanted to uh, I wanted to just touch on some of your uh, iconic photos that you've captured. And I'm just going to list a few. And, and rather than ask you your favorite one, um, <laughs> I, I'd like to ask you which one evoked the most in, inspirational kind of emotion. 
Oh, okay. Um, um, MJ hugging the trophy, Magic and Bird guarding each other from a free throw, uh, Kobe and Phil after winning, um, Magic and MJ, uh, LeBron's dunk, uh, <laughs> the uh, the walking on air dunk, um, Kobe's windmill dunk, the 2K, 2K21 cover, which is coming up. I'd love mm-hmm. to hear about mm-hmm. that one. Yeah, uh, I mentioned KD and Steph Curry. Um, any of those kind of wow. jump at you? Well, they they all have a story. Every every one of those pictures has a story, and maybe we'll talk about that in a, on another podcast. Yeah, uh, for minute. sure. But um, you know, if if there's one one photo of that group, it, it's got to be magic. I'm sorry, Michael holding the trophy, the first trophy in '91. I mean, that was just such in the at the time it was a historic moment it was you know michael jordan's first championship took him seven years to get to that mountaintop we were all part of that journey you know all of us who were in the room in in the locker room when uh, that occurred um and to have to have that raw emotion come out and from him and then his dad so beautifully next to him uh, trying to just not even console him but just to be there for him was beautiful and then that photo took on a whole life of its own obviously um you know michael won five more right. championships after that michael's dad was murdered uh, a couple of years later after his dad's murder i got a call from michael's office uh, asking for a, a, a personal print you know for michael because he loved that picture I mean, it just it just meant so much. And now looking back on it, as with some of my other photos that you mentioned, I mean, it you know they're part of NBA history. So, right. you know, Magic and Bird, David Stern said that 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 photo helped define the era. You know, for your boss to say that to you, and publicly, um, pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. And it yeah. also, you know, you also put the gauntlet down. Like, okay, you, you got that. What are you gonna? What's coming next? <laughs> All right. right. <laughs> and and those are the kind of challenges I live for. So cool, man. Um, I want to ask you so many questions, but I want to respect your time. One one question that comes to mind is timing. And mm-hmm. you remind me of an athlete because nowadays with the remote uh, with remote cameras, you mm-hmm. know, um, especially during COVID and stuff, you have to have really good timing on that remote, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And athletes have to have that timing. Uh, coaches have to have that timing. Really successful, inspiring people have good or great timing. Mm-hmm. Could you talk a little bit about timing specifically for what I think one of the dunks from that you got from LeBron where he had like a scissor kick and he yeah. just, yeah. yeah, you know, you know, which one I'm talking well, that's, about. That's the, the walking on air one you're talking about. That's, okay. Yeah. That one. Yeah, that was so, a, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah that, so it, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, timing is all about preparation, quite frankly. Um, especially when it comes to setting up these remote cameras, which are cameras that are stationary, put in strategic spots around the court, you know, mm-hmm. um, so it's all about preparation. It's hours and hours of setup time. Um, it's experience. Um, it's also patience. You know, what I do requires a tremendous amount of patience because the way I shoot, Aaron, and it, it, it's a long explanation, but basically I can only shoot one picture every four seconds. I can't shoot a motor drive sequence of 10 images in a second and pick one out of there. You know, I, I can only shoot one picture. I have to count in my head four times, you know, four seconds and I can shoot another picture because these huge strobes that I use, these huge flashes that that go up in the catwalks of arenas, they put out so much power that it takes them four seconds to recycle back up that you can shoot again. Um, And if you shoot in between during the recycle period, you'll either get a blank frame you know, cause you won't have any light or you'll blow the thing up. <laughs> so, and that both of those things have happened. Um, wow. And you can't reset them and you know, might as well go home at that point. Uh, so that takes tremendous discipline, um, especially when it comes to, you know, the young Kobe who is a dunk machine. I mean, the kid would dunk like four or five times a game, you know, MJ was the same way, you know, picture, you know, being on the baseline with magic Johnson coming like a freight train, down sent down the middle of the court. He's got worthy on one side. He's got coop on the other side. He's doing like 19 moves. You know, he's looking one way passing the, <laughs> I mean, when do you shoot that? <laughs> you right, know? right, right. Where is the picture in there? Uh, and you get burned a lot, but then you learn, you learn, you just learn. You got to, you got to wait a millionth of a second, you know, that something is going to happen. You know, a guy like Shaq, 
uh, very predictable. You know, he's going to dunk. I mean, you know, he's right, going right. to dunk, but, <laughs> but it's like, when do you shoot that dunk? Because you don't get his arms in, in, in his face. You don't get the ball in his face. You know, the net in his face or a player, a defender. Kareem, same way, beautiful sky hook. But to get the sky hook at its apex, at his most beautiful moment, you know, took tremendous amount of discipline and patience, to be honest with you. Um, so, you know, that again, I t- keep talking about challenges. And to me, challenges are inspiring. <laughs> because yeah. That keeps the juices flowing. That keeps the creative energy going. And uh, when I go to, a, it could be any game, any game, you name a game in any, any city, any time could be preseason. It could be a meaningless game, you know, somewhere in, 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 during the season, conference final, a finals game, doesn't matter what it is. Um, I approach every game the same way. And I learned that from, from the greats. I learned that yeah. from, magic every single game learn that from watching kobe these guys never mailed it and they never they never mailed in even you know one quarter of a game i mean right they, they came to play and i i i was i mean i know this is the name of the podcast but i was very inspired by that you know if yeah. they can do that i can do that <laughs> yeah well i think that's the whole key is finding that relatability right is is relating not everyone has the talent or even the desire to be a, a nba superstar or a hall of fame photographer but if we can mm-hmm. take these things these tools and, and find inspiration from people like yourself yeah from the kobe's then we can make them relatable to our lives you know mm-hmm. yeah for so, sure i think we we all do that and 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 as fans we we look at these larger than life figures and why, why do we, you know, honor them so much? Why do they mean so much to us? Because we feel something from right. watching. We, we're attached to them emotionally. Um, you know, sports has a tremendous family legacy. Um, you know, how many times do you go to Staples Center and you'll see, you know, three generations of Laker fans or you go to a Dodger game and you'll see uh, the, right. grand, the grandpa's wearing like, you know, a Duke Snyder jersey. The dad is wearing, <laughs> you know, maybe a Steve Garvey jersey. And the kid is wearing a Kershaw jersey, you know. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's wonderful. That's one of the reasons that my partners and I started Legends of Sport, because we wanted to keep that spotlight on iconic athletes, iconic moments, teams, venue, even venues, um, personalities that, were part of all of our lives that somehow, you know, maybe just like the spotlight turned or somebody, you know, took a misstep in life and we want to help them back into the spotlight and, and, you know, make them relevant again. Absolutely. Well, with our remaining time here and shout out to the Dodgers who just won the world yeah, series. For um, sure. I think, yeah. I think the first time ever the Lakers and the Dodgers won in the same month, right? Yeah. The same month, <laughs> yeah, not the same year. <laughs> Because in 88, I was working for both teams. I was, I was the Dodger team photographer in 88. And I was also working for the NBA and the Lakers team photographer. And that was unbelievable. But that was separated by, what, four months? Because right, right, right. Lakers won in June and the Dodgers won in October. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. Well, yeah. So I was saying um, with our remaining few minutes here, I wanted to actually talk about your podcast because I'm extremely inspired by your podcast, Legends mm-hmm. of Sport. Yeah. Um, just a few. I'm just going to rattle off a few names that I wrote down that I was inspired by that you've had these great episodes with. I mean, Kobe, Magic, Candace Parker, Michael Cooper, mm-hmm. Steve Kerr, Jerry West, Baron Davis, Derek Fisher. I could go on and on. Uh, Hope Solo, Tony Hawk, Bill Walton. I mean, these uh, these people are icons themselves can you just touch on what you first of all what was the inspiration behind starting it i think you just kind of touched on that but expand on that and then second of all like what you've been learning with this this journey of podcasting specifically with these legends yeah well when we when we decided to launch the platform we really looked really hard at this at the social media and the sports media landscape. And uh, we felt we felt like Legends of Sport really filled a niche. You know, we're not interested in in uh, if Mookie Betts went three for four last night. Um, but I am interested in how maybe, you know, if he did something great in, in a World Series game, how that related to maybe what somebody else did, you know, 30 for sure. years ago. Um, you know, if Kobe went for... 40 plus points, you know, five times in a row. How did that relate to, you know, somebody else who did that feat or how can we relate this day in sports history, which we do every day on our blog 
we talk about what happened today in sports history and then try to tie that into what's happening today. So we're kind of like, I don't know, a bridge between then and now sort of. Yeah. Um, and then I, I started doing a show on the, on the Lakers spectrum network, which was time Warner at the time, which is a show that I pitched called through the lens where I would sit with a Laker personality and talk about their career through my photos. Yeah. And, um, you know, it could be anybody from Jeannie Buss to Phil Jackson, James Worthy, Gary Vitti, Robert Ori. And I found like, honestly, Aaron, I found like I was really comfortable doing it, you know, it, and I had a great producer and, and she just said, any, you know, first of all, we're taping this is not live. You screw up, we'll do it again. But, you know, just imagine there's no camera here and you're like at a bar or you're in, in, in a restaurant or your living room and you're talking to these guys, they're all friends of yours, you know. So it was super easy. And I found that um, that what was most inspiring and interesting to me was that everybody has a story. I mean, it sounds right. it sounds trite and it sounds, you know, simple, but there's a story behind everybody's greatness. That's right. right. I mean, Jeannie yeah. Buss Jeannie Bus talked about, you know, her dad. Uh, we spent the whole pod, the, the whole show talking about her dad um, and what how he inspired her and 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 gave her the business acumen that she has to run a major franchise, you know? Um, I mean, even Phil Jackson, I remember talking to him and I had talked to him before over dinners and stuff, but you know, his journey and, and, you know, it was amazing to me and, uh, and who mentored him and everyone had a mentor and every, everyone had somebody in their life who had a pivotal moment, inspired them, pushed them, motivated them, changed their life in some way. Um, I remember talking to Kirk Gibson. I'll just give you an example. It's got kind of a gruff personality, you know, but we would we want to have Kirk on to, on the podcast to talk about his iconic home run. We were coming up to the anniversary and uh, we had done some research and I, I didn't realize that Kirk was, was, was an all American football player in college. Right. And he talked about how he was a better football player than he was a baseball player. And he was destined for the NFL. He's definitely a first round pick. And his football coach took him aside and said, Hey, you know what, dude, I think you'd be better off playing baseball. <laughs> I mean, you're a good football player, but you know, durability and, and just life. And, and you, you just seem more blessed for baseball. And he took that advice and, you know, there he went. And uh, you know, Eric Dickerson talked about similar thing, talked about racism where he grew up in Texas and, how he couldn't even play football as a, as a black kid in the town that he lived in. He had to go to another town to play. I mean, unbelievable stories, you know, and uh, you know, fast forward to season three, which we're in right now and talking to Jerry West, I mean, the logo himself about his mental health journey and how forthcoming he was. And man, it just, um, Sometimes I just sit back and I just listen and I'm like, wow, I cannot believe I'm talking to this person. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, but the, I think the podcasts come out very honest and I think um, the conversations um, are always great. And I, I'm so thankful to everybody, the, the, the guests that I know, the guests I don't know, but I get to know them on my podcast and we become friends and I'm working now with, with some guests that, I didn't even know before I started the podcast. Yeah. So we partnered with the LA times um, in July for our third season. So now we're released through the LA times platform. Um, we started off with a 16 week block of restarting the clock, which was uh, basically um, an episode each week talking about the NBA and WNBA bubbles. So I had guests that would, would speak to that, but also in, in a broader sense. So I would have Derek Fisher on ta to talk about being with the sparks and coaching them in the WNBA bubble, but of course we would talk about his career. And of course we would talk about Kobe and right. almost every guest that I have, we talk about Kobe because yeah. everybody has a Kobe story, whether they knew him, played with him or were just inspired by him. Um, right. Everybody has a Kobe connection and it's mind blowing to me. It really is. I mean, it's like driving through LA like you do and you see all of these Kobe murals all over the place. Yeah. I have a friend, Mike Asner, who, and I'm going to promote his, his Instagram, which is called Kobe mural. And he has a website, Kobe mural.com where he tracks every Kobe and GG mural in the world. Cool. It's like five, 600 murals every day. He's posting new ones. 
and the love for Kobe that's out there um, and the way that artists have expressed themselves and the grief that they've felt um, very cathartic for them, for Mike to be able to bring that gift of, of the, of the website to the world for me to document it. So stay tuned for that because we, we have some projects coming up around that. Yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah. Andy, I know you got to run, man. I'm so thankful and grateful for you spending some time uh, on the podcast today. Um, I'm inspired by you and, and can't wait to, to keep checking out your podcast and see what you got next. So well, thanks, thanks so Aaron. much, man. Aaron, true pleasure, man. And keep doing what you do because, um, you know, like I told you off air, we, you know, you're doing something that's really different. You found a cool. niche. Um, you're speaking to some, some real emotion, which I think is great. And, uh, you know, any way I can help, you know, you let me know. Thank you so much. Real quick before you go, just let us know how we can find your podcast and oh, yeah. and all that. And of you, course, all that yeah. Stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Pod, the podcast Legends of Sport can be found on the LA Times app or on the LA Times online uh, or Apple, Spotify, you know, any of your um, podcast platforms that are out there, your favorite ones. So we're released through the times, but we're also on those platforms. And then we have our social media, you know, uh, our Instagram at legends of sport. Our Twitter is at legends underscore of sport. We have a daily blog, like I said, which is legends of sport dot blog, which is interactive. And um, we rely a lot on, on the people who, um, who tune in, who download, who react to the blog. Um, we also have a TikTok and YouTube channel it's called legends of sport. Every cool. podcast now from the thir starting in the third season is done like you do on video. So you can get the audio version and the video on YouTube. And my photography can be found at ADB Photo Inc. So you'll see a lot of my legendary moments and uh, hopefully some of my iconic photos, if you consider them iconic, um, on my Instagram posting pretty much every day. So stay tuned as the NBA season is about to start because we'll be loading up all those platforms. <laughs> Great. Awesome. And then can you sign my book when I, when oh, I get dude, it? Oh, like, dude, 100%. My, I meant sign, you know, the book that you and Kobe created. I, yes, I, was, of course. I just ordered it. So I'd like to get that signed. <laughs> well, that gives us an excuse to get together down where you are. And yes. uh, we will definitely do that. 100%. Awesome. Yeah. Andy, thank you so much, brother. Appreciate Thanks. you. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks, Aaron. Great to meet you and great to chat with you today. Thanks so much. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you so much for joining me on Within the Game podcast. Visit withinthegame.com for show notes and links on everything we talked about today. You can also subscribe to the mailing list, which will give you exclusive content from each guest, as well as more resources to help you stay inspired in and out of your game. Follow us on Instagram at Within the Game podcast. Thank you.